All right. Um, thank you. <laughs> Liven things up a bit. Um, who here knows what bimodal architecture even is? Let's start with that. I'll raise a small finger. Okay. So, bimodal. So this is architecture in two modes, where um, what used to be called legacy, and now called mode one, uh, this is Gardner speak, yeah? Uh, com is combined with what used to be called agile architecture, now known as mode two. So um, you've got to picture that most companies are trying to adopt agile, and in their effort to adopt agile, they're making everything agile. Um, and it's not working for everybody. So what Gartner observed is, you know, some things are just better done in the old silos, waterfall yeah. style thing. So how do you combine the old and the new? Or uh, should I say the, the new and the new because they're both still being developed. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I'm living this um, at the moment at Visions Connected. That's a video company. They do video meetings. Uh, for Dutch government, for the police, for healthcare, um, but also for uh, entertainment, like um, a dance event. So lots of stuff going on at the same time. And on the technology side, that means we have to balance things between Cisco and you know the bigger vendors on the one hand and quick development daily releases on the other. So that's where we are. So now you might want to strike a compromise between uh, you know, the, the, the new and the old. And um, I'm trying to avoid compromises. My sister put it like this. She says, you know, what do you mean compromise? Am I wrong? So what you should strive for is a so-called win-win situation. And um, that's a bit harder because win-win is not always obvious. And I'll give you an example. So I was in the market square uh, of Delft, which is a very nice little town. We have this huge market square. And we have all these little restaurants around it. And I was there with my two kids, and obviously, uh, you know, I made the mistake of saying, oh, let's, let's have a sandwich somewhere. And they both wanted to go to a different restaurant. And as a parent, you're usually, you know, you usually mediate. You say, all right, let's go to that one, let's go to that one. So this time, well, there's, you know, now seven and nine. Um, this time I wanted to do it right, and I want to involve them, you know, the, the modern things to do as a parent. So what I did is I started asking them, what is it about the restaurant that you like? So my daughter and my son, they each explained for their restaurant, the one they picked, why that was the best restaurant to go to. And as it turned out, my son wanted to go to a restaurant where they have games. In many, many restaurants in Holland, they have board games, you know, like chess, and the simple board games are lying around. You can just pick them up and play if you like. And my daughter wanted to go to a restaurant where there's a window close to the canal so she could see the duck. Um, luckily, there is a restaurant that has both the games and the duck. So this is what I call a win-win situation. But it's the hard step to take. It's the, you know, you can't just go, oh, this is the solution, right? Uh, it takes a while for everybody to find their place. And uh, I doubt that my daughter ever looked at the ducks or my son played any games because, you know, by the time we get there, that's forgotten. But the exercise was worth it. Let me put it like that. So what, what I did when I started at Visions Connected, at the company that I'm in now, is I started to draw an architecture picture because, uh, with all respect to them, it was missing. So, um, and, and what I usually do is I start, you know, drawing, drawing, usually on whiteboards, uh, so, so that I ask for one. And what I want to do is to take you with me on a journey that I took to discover the, that the architecture would be suitable for visions connected right and what I do I don't know if you guys can read it I'll uh, move it over a bit is I look for the driving principles for the architecture what are the things that make the company tick what are the things that are important that we have to keep or that are important we have to show so that people will see them and decide to change it and these are the things roughly that I worked on so the market vision is obviously is a good place to start uh, not always, because some companies don't have market vision, but Vision Connected has a very clear picture of where they want to go. And the story, simplified, goes something like this. We have many different customers, and we want to be close to the customer. right? We're doing video, video meetings, high-end, 
uh, we're adapting to the, what the customer needs, something that our competitors can't or won't or won't do. Yeah, if you look at things like Zoom and Skype, they don't adapt very much to your needs, right? Or as a company, you can't go to Zoom and say, guys, can you change this? And that is stuff that we do offer, right? So customer intimacy is something they mentioned. So let's start at the top. And this I found. I can see that in the organization, we have uh, healthcare. Don't worry about reading my handwriting, okay? We've got justice. We've got government and you know other smaller stuff like entertainment etc so there's a couple of things at the top uh, we call them product market combinations what's in a name and what i discovered at the time was that the the technology was organized around this so you would see that there was a system supporting healthcare there was a system for justice department for governmental and there were several systems doing this and several specials for customers. And that's fine, um, except that you know, behind this sits the video infrastructure, and that's actually pretty expensive. Right? This is usually Cisco, Polycom. Uh, you know, that's the high-end, not very cheap stuff. But let's not go there too quickly. So changing market also, right? Video, video meetings is something that's becoming much more of a commodity. And um, you know, if you if you now look at the market compared to 10 years ago, there are lots of players that weren't there, and even big companies like Cisco are seeing, hey, wait, the market is changing, and they need to go. We need to go with them. Thank you. So what we need for the market f from the technology is the ability to do that customer intimacy, to do personalization. Well, on a company level, not on a user level, but to allow companies to have their own logos, to have their own look and feel, and to allow tweaks to the, the systems that fit their use case, right? And to some extent, it's all, you know, either you're doing a video meeting ad hoc or you do one planned, uh, maybe recurrent, um, and you send email in templates, and that's sort of it, right, on one end. On the other hand, you know, a video meeting is something completely different if you're looking, if this is a, uh, a, a crimi criminal investigation than it is for you know uh, a dance hall, for example, right? It's all a video meeting on the technology side, but for the customer, it's something completely different. Yeah, and it's easy as technologists to think, oh, it's all a video meeting, and and to build accordingly. But we can't get away with that because we have pledged to focus on our customers and to make sure that they get what they need, regardless of what the technology wants. That's something to keep in mind. All right, so then we look at the company as it is. So I'm, I'm looking inside the company now, and I'm looking at sport and operations. And um, the first thing they told me, uh, literally on day one, is that you know um, I, I explained a bit about my background. I come from chat applications, Nimbus, NGTI. So I come from a fairly you know service-oriented world myself. And I talked to them about that, and the first thing one of the admins says, well, I like si silos, you know, don't touch my silos. Because the nice thing about silos is, and I have, to, I have to agree, if the damn thing works, it works, right? And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And there's a certain elegance to that. You know, it's nice to look at a system, see it works, and thus it works, all of it. Plus, if it doesn't work for the Justice Department, that doesn't say anything about the rest. There's no, none of this service interdependency that we're sort of hung up on, right? Some of it you saw in the previous presentation by Jan. Um, you know, you've got 30 plus components running. If one dies, the other guys go with it as well. Well, that's kind of sort of true in many systems. So he liked the silos. And uh, okay, that's a good point, fair point. Um, what I do see is that there's a lot of data entry. So for example, you've got healthcare has users, right? But justice also has users, okay? Governmental systems also have users. We've got lots of little databases that do the same thing all over the place. Here's users, here's users. And there's, you know, VMRs, vi virtual meeting rooms. So if you've got rooms configured here and here on the video infrastructure and here and here, and then when we board a new customer, for example, in healthcare, we have to change this and we have to change this and make sure that's correct here. And 
There's lots of manual stuff everywhere, large Excel sheets of what has and hasn't been entered in what system. And that's confusing because, you know, if the Justice Department and the government work together, they have the same video conference system but with a different user interface and a different user set. This is, this, you know, you can see that while this looks nice on paper, in practice it creaks. So there's stuff we need to do about that. But again, if you talk to the support guys, you know, their systems, they, they're used to this silo-oriented system. So if I'm, and I am going to change it, if I'm going to change this towards a more service-oriented architecture, they're going to need a map of the world. They need to be able to say, all right, this is broken, so therefore that works and this doesn't. They do that now because this silo is broken, therefore this organization can work and everybody else can't. But they, that simplicity is something we need to keep. And they need automation of daily tasks. I mean, it, I don't know if this is normal in enterprise systems, you know, because this is the first real enterprise thing. But these things, the, the large infrastructure things, need care and feeding. It's like shoveling coal. You know, oh, we, we tweak the SIP registration. Oh, something goes offline. We have to start it. All day, every day, people are nudging it and tweaking it and, and, and they're futzing with it all the time. How about that? I don't know, honestly. Sometimes, I mean, it's all, off, all over the place. But mainly, it's odd limitations in the video infrastructure. It's like, well, you, can't, you, you can do this, but if you restart it, some components come out automatically, and some you have to nudge along, and then they come back. And it, it's, <sighs> I don't know. The stuff here going on, and there is a lack of focus on automation. And that is something, if you look at a bimodal architecture, the guys in mode two, the agile world, are used to automating, right? Of course you automate because there's 30 components, so you better not do one manual because you'll forget. But if all you ever do is take that, you know, once a year update from Cisco and put it on your box, why automate? You know, and, and that mentality of why automate, you st it sticks with you until you're doing every th something every day and you're still not automating. Right. Yeah. That's odd. I think that's odd. I agree, but I think it's odd. <laughs> so they need a simple, simple world, right? And what we need there is uh, centralization of data, so that when you introduce a customer, you can then say what silo he works for. So one of the things we do is we take all these user bases and we set up an SSO system where all the users live and then whoopa, across all the systems we can use that, right? We have one user registry, one user directory where we do meetings, they're scheduled here and uh, here. Why are we scheduling meetings? And, you know, for that matter, why are programmers writing out meeting scheduling software? Uh, there's a very good meeting database, and you use it every day. It's called Microsoft Exchange, right? Much as I dislike Microsoft, that thing is actually pretty damn cool. So why not put all the meetings in Exchange and stop fussing with, you know, re-implementing recurrence in Java. Have you ever coded against time zones? This is a system that, by definition, we're worldwide, so we have time zones in our system. It is being said, by the way, that if you have a European system, it has language support, and if you have a, an American system, you have time zone support. Uh, we have both. And language su support is the easy one. Time zone support is nasty. So you want something else that does that for you, preferably something from a vendor who keeps that stuff updated, and Microsoft does that. So why don't we take the meetings out of it and just put those into a meeting database? Let's call it Exchange. Interestingly, this also gives a good management interface for support because they're used to working with Exchange, right? I mean, we do our email in Exchange, we do our scheduling in Exchange, so if that is becomes the user interface for them to do support, a whole class of 
application admin screens just falls out of the system because, well, it's already there and it's better. Right? So that saves a lot of code. Any questions so far? Okay. So looking at Cisco, I, I described the coal shoveling that I saw earlier. Um, but the main thing that we have here is that we, we have infrastructure components that are big, that are expensive to run and are expensive to buy. And they have strange licensing models, right? I'm, I come from an open source world, so my license is, uh, licensing uh, consideration is, can I use it? Yes, no. Um, but this is, yeah, well, you can use it here, but if you use it this way, you use so many ports, which will cost you X amount of money per month. And if you use it that way, it costs you less ports, so it saves you a lot of money, but you need to program more. And that's a trade-off that I'm not used to making. So these things are expensive enough that we need to reuse them across the systems. Right now, we don't. We build a new little silo with everything on it. And that means that we have free licenses here that we cannot use here or here. So we end up paying double. So there's a need to reuse, and there's a need for abstraction. Because if you look at things like Cisco and Pexip and Akano and uh, the older Polycom systems, ultimately they do the same, right? They're video mixing things. They're much like what's the hardware that, that Christian has said in this room, except for video meetings. Right? So on the one hand, these things are the same. On the other hand, you know, Pexip can do some things that Cisco can't, and Cisco can do things that Pexip can't. So we want extra abstraction, but not too much. Uh, I think I have slide for that. Yeah. So if we're looking at the abstraction, whoop. So you've got vendor one. and vendor two, they're both making video mixing stuff, right? Either hardware or software. And as customer, you put an abstraction on top of that. I'll call it broker, name doesn't matter. And what it does, it allows my applications to use each of these as if we're, they were the same, right? I can, I can have a Pexip room, or I can have an Akano room, or I can have a conductor room, and they all act the same for me. But that's just the abstraction removing features, right? That means you get the lowest common denominator, which is not uh, ultimately what we stand for because we're trying to give the best customer service here. We're trying to give these people the, the best of the infrastructure. So what we're actually doing is that we're using the abstraction only to drive the things that we can do in an abstracted way. So creating rooms, managing rooms, but once you're in a video meeting and the features of each of these machines start counting, that's when you program against the raw machine, right? So your applications, where possible, use the abstraction. And at some point, they switch over and they jump into the machine as it's supposed to be used. And that gives you access to all the features, to all the layouts that you can use with Cisco or the WebRTC support that, that um, uh, Pexip has. Further, we need the abstraction because most of the use cases actually don't need specialized features, right? So many of these systems, especially here in the smaller systems, can all use the abstracted video machines because they don't actually need the detailed, uh, they, don't, they don't actually need the uh, special features that they have. But here, there's a different consideration. Depending on the usage, this one or that one may be cheaper for that particular use case. Right, so there again, you see that the licensing model m makes it so that we need to be able to switch in the front end, we need to be able to switch to different back end. And this is runtime. I mean, I don't want to do uh, a redeploy just because that room now is on Akano instead of on Pexip. Right, that stuff we want to enable um, runtime. It's getting messy, but I'll clean it up in a bit. Where's my clicker? There you go. Okay, and the final driving force is external developers. And this is interesting to see because if you look at Visions Connected, we're a fairly back-end component oriented uh, company. We have no front-end developers in-house at this time, right? Much as we'd like to, uh, we just have back-end guys. And we are partnering with an external company 
and they do front-end developers. And it's very interesting to see the culture in these two companies because in this company that I'm in now, it's very much about stability, it's about extraction, it's about you know, slow progress. Whereas if you look at the external developers, you know, these guys, they, they play with the latest frameworks, they're enthusiastic about essentially everything that they haven't touched ever. Um, and they lose interest, you know, 10, ten minutes after. So, and it's a, it's a beautiful combination because you've got guys available, uh, though external, but still available for you to make new applications and to make them quickly because these guys are oriented towards making small demonstrator type user interfaces. And in that, you know, they're used to working greenfield. They're used to making stuff and then forgetting about it. And then we can start taking these things and making them into production. But it, it, the problem is then they've made a demonstrator or they've, it's been called a proof of concept or something like that. And suddenly we've sold it, right? Accidentally. And then boom, it's production. And then the admins go, look, you know, this is not up to, it's a different programming language. It runs on Linux, not on Windows. It, you know, there's all kinds of stuff wrong with it. Why they can't run it in production? So my question is, how do I offer the external company a way to abide with our standards, right, to work towards our architecture, rather than introducing new stuff that will cause this discussion every time? They like to do greenfield, so I need to find a way to offer them APIs to our infrastructure that'll make them faster if they use them, right? It's very easy to say, well, you've got to program Java, and then what happens is they mark up 40% on the project price. And then somebody says, well, why did you do not do Java? And boom, price goes down, that, that gets commissioned. Interesting. On the other hand, now we've defined some internal interfaces and that allows them uh, us to steer them a bit. I'll show you what we're doing. If I may um, take the back half of these applications off. And I'll redraw the infrastructure a little more cleanly. So if you look at the applications that we've built, first off we've got user management, which we've already factored out. Now, obviously, we need a backend and front end to support things like this, right? You need your JavaScript, your, your web APIs, here, your web um, uh, applications here, and then you need some form of backend to handle the request and to uh, uh, do the abstraction. And then what we do is we capture the features of our system in feature components. So think of this as uh, meeting scheduling and a uh, pretty email. And let's not forget uh, room management. Virtual meeting room management, right? So these are the components that we have internally. These have APIs that we expose not to the world, but we expose these to our partners that are developing software. And they can say, oh, let's make a demonstrator of something tricky here. But as long as they abide by these APIs, they have what they want, which is quick development. They can really quickly uh, schedule meetings, and they can send pretty emails about the, about the scheduling. And they don't have to re-implement user, uh, user management because it's all part of the single sign-on system. Right? So we're, we're offering them components and ways to work which will actually allow them to offer the systems to us at a cheaper price because they don't have to reinvent that square wheel on the side that they did all the time. And then here we've got our video infrastructure components, the large ones that depending on the needs, they can go to the abstraction or they can go direct, right? In this case, if they just need room management, they can do it on the abstraction. If they re need specific features, they can go to Paxif straight. Those are the things we can do. So let's review. In closing, we need the ability to assimilate them, right? They can do projects quicker now. The external developer can do proje uh, projects quicker now. In fact, what we've done, we've asked them to participate in developing these APIs, uh, and which means that they now have people in-house 
who know these APIs because they built them. We specify this in Swagger, not in Word. I don't know about you guys, but Word allows a lot of room for error. Swagger helps a lot binding these APIs and making it possible to do code generation on both sides. This in turn brings the price down for the external developer and the quality up. It's pretty cool. We need a throwaway mentality, right? This, these demonstrators are sometimes just that, right? We need to put demonstrators on production and, and accept them as they are. This is something that we uh, need to change. We need to think more, we as Vision Connected need to think more in terms of code that can be thrown away and code that stays longer and stuff that we have to live with for the rest of our lives. It's sort of a gradient, if you will, right? And we need the ability to experiment. We need to put something in production, and it may be something in Ruby, right? It may be Python. It may be jo Node. I don't know. And what we said is, well, well, we'll accept that on this level. But as things go more into long term, we keep them uh, more up to standard. So this stuff all is in Java. This stuff all is vendor specific, right? This is vendor stuff, Java. And this is preferably Java, but maybe something else, right? Front end, always static HTML, CSS, in order to allow us to do that split. Go back one more slide for the abstraction. So we have abstraction for the simple things, and we have raw access direct on the video hardware where needed. And again, we expose this only to our, customer, uh, our, um, our partners, not to our customers. Right, so the customers only get the applications. They have no access to either. Right, they only get application access. The vendor dynamics, this allows us to switch between these when it's abstracted so that we can make use of the licenses. We can consolidate the licenses, can reuse them, but we can also decide to switch between technologies if licensing is cheaper that way. Because these prices at this moment are being renegotiated uh, literally as we speak but also in the market, because the market is changing so fast, the licensing models that people are using here are being discussed. I mean, that's how, uh, how, how much flux there is in the market at this point. And we need the ability to reuse. Well, that, I think that's pretty obvious. For operations, we need to start thinking in automation, Then it helps if you know, the automation, the, the changes are limited to only uh, a certain portion of the infrastructure. This stuff, we can leave as it is today much more than we can do today, right? Because interestingly now, if we introduce a new silo, we don't need a large chunk of expensive infrastructure and we don't need the management that comes with it, right? So the reuse actually helps and the automation is something that for, for developers is pretty easy to do. Centralized data is again, I haven't drawn it here yet. I'm trying to draw with my clicker, that won't work. Um, so we have the um, exchange backend for the, uh, for the meetings. And we've got the configuration management database, GMDB. Uh, both of these work to consolidate da data and the users. So this allows support, instead of putting data in all the systems, put it in a central place, and the systems will go pick it up when they need it. Users, same thing, you just add users. Mark the capabilities, and they'll start getting access to different parts of the system. Meetings don't recode recurrence all the time. The map of the world is still on the table. That is something that's up to the developers to be able to communicate. And that is a training, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't think people realize how hard their work is to understand for other people. It's easy to think, well, it's clear, it's, you know, it's just a component, but there are literally people who don't know what a component is. Um, and it's hard to understand if that's the world that you live in. And finally, the market vision. We're back at the market vision. We have now the ability to experiment. These front ends, since they're static HTML, HTML um, web apps, we can exchange them quickly. We can have multiple versions in production uh, at the same time. So that's stuff that allows us to move really quickly here and then all the way back, right? This is truly the mode two of our system and all the way back to mode one in the back end here. And this is what we're going to run with today. Any final questions? Yes, sir.
This one, yes. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, the actual application, I would say. So this is where the mapping happens between what the user expects and the, um, uh, what the infrastructure can provide. For example, fundamental to a system is that when you are a customer, you have multiple meeting rooms, right? And, um, but in this area, you're maybe a customer that has only one meeting room. And that mapping, sort of the conceptual mapping between, oh, you have any number of meeting rooms versus only one, that happens here. And it consists indeed of uh, sort of the Java backend of it and the Java script front end of it. So this is a, a two-part thing, both geared towards the customer, right? This is below this line, you're geared towards the infrastructure. do at the, fr at the front door, plus by the fact that you have no uplinks, right? So these components are unaware of these components other than via the API that they provide, right? So at the front door, plus by the fact that you have no uplinks, right? So these components are unaware of these components other than via the API that they provide, right? So Healthcare can use our application, can use our backend, can use our feature components, but the feature components are, don't have a connection to the front end. They don't know how to reach them, right? So all initiative is at the top, and you do calls into the infrastructure, but you never go back up, okay? Uh, that isn't a security feature, but it's a, that's a, a, an architectural principle that we applied there. Yeah, so so picture the, the, the sales guys, they go out, they rent out the vi virtual meeting rooms that we have, yeah. and they, s they set up support for, for example, video endpoint. So you can have a screen this size with a camera, yeah. uh, you know, made by Cisco or Pec um, Polycom. One, uh, yeah, and that kind of stuff is then maintained and managed by us. Yeah. So yeah. Our billing cycle is very simple because we, we do fixed price per room per month. So we actually have a pretty simple billing system. And we've seen competitors who do minute billing and they have departments to do what we have a guy doing. So there's a, there's a big difference there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is, is actually quite simple because if you look at our traffic, the, the video uh, you've got to imagine the video endpoints, they're doing the actual video through our video infrastructure. And this so our capacity planning is do we have enough video capacity? Yeah. you an idea of how we do uh, so these kinds of experiments okay uh, they do require because the capacity is limited by the licensing model not Any other questions while I'm changing my clothes? Okay. Any other questions? Then I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention and for your questions.